Let me ask a question that the video launched into. I need to ask you, and you don't have to respond but by a show of hands, but how many of you have ever said, why am I here? Anybody ever wondered that? Why am I here? What purpose do I serve? For those of us who have ever asked that question, we've often wondered if there is a divine purpose, a reason that I exist. Many of us have gone through rough waters, deep waters, trials, tribulations, and we wondered what it was all worth. What's the reason for it? These are common questions that many of us have asked ourselves, but those questions go to the very core of our existence. And many of us don't have answers. Why am I here? I think for some of us, when we ask those questions, we get to answers like, well, I think, maybe, or I hope this But I think for most of us, at some point, especially when we're asking those questions, we don't have any earthly idea why we're here and the purpose for which God has planted me here. Our working vision that I kind of unrolled a few weeks ago, and after some explanation as far as where we've been as a church at our last leadership retreat coming from another retreat that uh, a number of us went to at Beulah Beach. This is where we arrived. This is our working vision, and it explains our purpose as a church. This is why we're here. And simply stated, it's this. We exist. You get that? That's our purpose. We exist to create environments where people encounter hope gain purpose, and experience transformation by winning, building, and equipping people for Christ. Well, that might be a little lengthy, but two weeks ago, before the snow hit last week, we talked about what it is to create environments where people can encounter hope, and scripturally what that means to be a people of hope And then we interviewed Scott and Kelly Knott and how they have found this hope and how it has changed and transformed them. Today we want to look at the second of our purposes. We exist so that people can gain purpose. Now as much as our society is all around us, people without hope, I think that we would also say that those people who are without without hope are also aimless. Without purpose. It doesn't take long to see that, does it? People outside of Jesus are striving to have some kind of inner need met. And they try to do it through possessions, popularity, relationships, and it all fails. What does it mean to create an environment where people will gain purpose. I want you to understand, in a general sense this morning, what I'm going to say is true, and it's a generic statement, but the Scriptures are very clear about our purpose, and it is stated at least four different times. matter of fact, it's contrasted, even in the book of Titus, seven times. But four times in Titus, in chapter 2, verse 7, it says to show yourself to be an example of good deeds. You and I, generically, are supposed to be people of good deeds. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, be ready for every good deed. Chapter 3, verse 8, be careful to engage in good deeds. And then in chapter 3, verse 14, learn to engage in good deeds. So we're supposed to be a people, generically at least, to do good deeds, good works. Now I want you to understand this because many people would think 
that good deeds is why we're here. But we recognize, because Titus is very clear, that it's not the good deeds that makes us acceptable to God or that provides the basis for our salvation. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says, He, God, saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So it's not the deeds that saves us and makes us acceptable to God. The deeds is something that takes place after the moment that we place our faith in Him. We can say it this way. The practice of good deeds is the logical outcome of someone who has truly apprehended the grace of God. If you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not doing good deeds, I can tell you, as sure as I'm standing here, you're living outside of the will of God. One who is truly born again will naturally produce good deeds. And good deeds... I need to say this, before salvation, if we believe that it's good deeds that makes us saved and good deeds that saves us, then we're the 2019 version of the Pharisees. We need to be very clear that it's not the good deeds that makes us acceptable to God, it's because that we are in God's presence and we are God's children that then we can produce good deeds. So we recognize that in a general statement, We recognize that it is the will of God for us to have purpose to do good things, good deeds, good works. Make sense so far? Okay. Well, then let me define what I call purposed or purposeful deeds. For those of us who are born again of God's Holy Spirit, we've asked Him into our lives, into our hearts. We've asked Him to forgive us of sin and come and take up residence within us. For those of us, we now have a purposed or purposeful deed to do. Let me read this from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now listen, I don't think it can get any clearer than that. At the moment of salvation, we were created in Christ Jesus for what specific purpose? To do good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. Now catch this. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, know this. You and I have been created twice. Psalm 139 recognizes David as he's praying this awesome prayer He discusses the fact that he was wrought in the depths of the earth, inside his mother's womb, did God create him. Now that's physical birth. But there's also this second birth, this spiritual birth, where the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man, if any one of us is born again, we are a new creation. It says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. There is this idea that we are created now separately than our physical creation. And there's something special about that second creation that makes us different than every other person on the face of the globe. This second creation is specifically ours so that we might have a premise to do good things and a foundation on which we can do those things for other people. It's not because it makes us acceptable to God, but it gives us a power to do those things that before we met Jesus, we never had. Part of God's plan is to create us Twice. I love that. Because I recognize that God has a design and a plan and a purpose for everyone who is born physically. He desires them to be born spiritually. 
And for those of us who have already made that decision and trusted in Jesus and allowed him into our hearts and lives, we now have this second creation that gives us this sense of divine purpose. Those outside of Jesus don't understand that. So for us who are in Christ Jesus, we recognize we've been not only born twice, but at the moment of that second birth, at the second creation, there is that sense of divine purpose that begins to unfold from the inside out. Make sense? Okay. Is that working, Jeff? Hopefully. You'll see how something else unfolds, hopefully, in just a minute. God created us for good works. Now catch this. These are not just any good works or any good deeds. It's not the good deeds that you and I would choose. It's not the good deeds that we think makes us good. These are good deeds that God himself has prepared beforehand. God has a design, God has a plan, and God has a purpose for me as an individual, for you as an individual, and for us as a church. And God has prepared some things beforehand. Long before I ever was born physically, God had a plan for me spiritually. And God prepared some things beforehand so that we would walk in them. I can't get away from that in Ephesians 2.10. These good deeds are not just deeds that I think of. These are things that he's already prepared. And at the moment of salvation, his divine plan begins to unfold, and it begins to make sense. He creates me first. He created me second. But when he created me second, I understand that he loves me, and he knows me. And he knows me so intimately that what he also planned for me is also best for me. I can't tell you how many people I've heard that would say something like, you know what, I don't really want to listen to God that well because he might want me to be a missionary and serve in a land that I really don't want to go to. That kind of violates the reason for which... He allowed us to be born and birthed spiritually. The one who created us, the one who knows us intimately, has a plan for us. So at the moment of salvation, when that plan begins to unfold, it's something that I know that I can embrace because I recognize how deep his love is for me and how intimate he cares for me. He has prepared a work just for me. The beginning of verse 10 in Ephesians 2 says, for we are his workmanship. The Greek word is poema. It's the Greek word that we get the word in English, poem. Literally translated, it means that we are his work of art. His hand has been moving, his brush specifically changing, adding to, subtracting. We are his poema, we are his work of art, we are his workmanship, and we are deeply valued. Have you ever thought of yourself as a work of art? Now, I've heard some of you talk about someone else, and you say they're a piece of work, That's not quite what we're saying, is it? You're more than a piece of work. You are a beautiful, beautiful part of God's creation. You are his work of art. You are his workmanship. And you are being molded and shaped and fashioned into the beautiful image of the one who loves you and the one who died for you. And part of God's plan for you is being unfolded. So at the moment of salvation, he has now placed in you his divine plan and his divine purpose. The struggle that we face is many of us don't know what that is. 
to recognize the truth of God's word in Ephesians 2.10, is he done yet? Almost. Sometimes we don't see the artwork, do we? If you look at that, it doesn't make sense, does it? And we say, but wait a minute, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. God, he, it, no, it doesn't even look good. How many of you have ever thought that you just look like a big old mess? Now, be honest. Okay, those of you that didn't raise your hand, I know you're lying. Because the truth is there are times we look at our lives and we go, man, I, I don't know what this all is. I don't know what it is. I, don't, it, I can't make sense. And then God continues to unfold his perfect plan. And just like this guy, God's continuing because he's at work. And he's doing this thing. And he's beginning to unveil it. And he's beginning to unfold it. I just trust that you have the eyes to begin to see it. And as God continues to work, you continue to look and you continue to seek him, the one who knows you, the one who loves you. And when you seek him purposefully, intentionally, there comes a moment when God begins to reveal his perfect, divine purpose for you. He's almost done. Can anyone see what he's doing? It just looks kind of like a big modern mess. And I don't understand colors because all those colors don't seem to make sense to me, but now you begin to see what God does. And God has a plan. And He has a purpose for you. And sometimes it just seems totally upside down, doesn't it? You are his workmanship. You are his piece of art. And he created you in Christ Jesus with divine purpose. Now, let me be very clear if you haven't caught it. You have purpose. You have divine and eternal purpose. You as an individual have that. We as a corporate body... We don't know whether this was just the individual members inside the Ephesus church or whether this was for the Ephesian church as a corporate body, and I believe it was both. God is declaring that they as individuals have divine purpose and they as a church have a divine purpose. I believe it's both true. But here's the thing about having purpose. God expects you and me to walk in that purpose. He finishes his verse in Ephesians 2.10 so that you would walk in that. God expects you to discover what that purpose is. Now that might be an exciting journey for you to discover and unveil what that purpose is. It might be a process just like that painter and you're like, whoa, I don't get it. But you're allowing God to stroke this and move that and dip this. And it might not make sense to you right now, but that's okay. The process of discovery should be an adventure. It should be exciting. But it's also something, let me just say this, that gives direction to your life. When you begin to discover your purpose and you are then engaged in fulfilling that purpose, I'm going to tell you, there is something that is so deeply spiritually satisfying. In our leadership development group, we talk about developing spiritual energy. Listen, have you ever spent time in the, in the Word and time in prayer, but you still feel flat? Well, those are spiritual disciplines. You can't get away from that. But sometimes that doesn't develop spiritual energy. But I triple dog dare you to discover your purpose and then be engaged in fulfilling that purpose and not peel you off the ceiling somewhere. Because when you're fulfilling the design, purpose, and plan for God for your life, I'm telling you, it brings this divine satisfaction like nothing else. God delights in fulfilling our purpose. 
I'm not going to read it this morning, but Jeremiah chapter 1, if you could be in at verse 4, read all the way through verse 10, and you'll understand that Jeremiah understood his purpose. He said, when I was yet in, before I was formed in my mother's womb, you appointed me as prophet to do certain things. And you can read it in Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah knew that even before he was born, God had a plan, God had a purpose, and part of that purpose was for him to be a prophet and tell the things that God wanted him to foretell. And he was doing it. He recognized it. And there is great joy in God's heart when you and I understand and fulfill the purpose for which he places us here for Until you know your purpose, you will wander aimlessly in your Christian journey. And you will try different things, and you will be on a spiritual mountain trek. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because your spiritual life does well for a while, and you're on a spiritual high, and then all of a sudden you're on the spiritual low. And then something happens, and you're on a spiritual high, and then things don't go your way, and then you're on a spiritual low. Ever been there? Do you understand that that is not what the Word of God declares as far as your spiritual life and mine? God doesn't want us to be on a spiritual yo-yo where we're up again and down again and up again and down again. Now, we understand that sometimes as we are growing in the Christian life, if we were to chart it, you grow and then something happens and you dip a little bit and then you say, Jesus, this isn't it. Maybe I need to confess something and I repent and I get it right and so I start to grow again. And then, oh man, something else happens and then I dip and I go, wait a minute, God, that isn't it. I've taken that thought captive to the obedience of Christ and now I'm starting to grow again and you start growing again. That's the norm, not this thing. And sometimes we are in this pattern, way up, way down. And it's amazing to me how many people walk with Jesus today and then tomorrow almost profane his name. I believe it's because of this. When they really don't understand why God has them here, well, then they just like shoot aimlessly in the dark and hope, hope that this is something that will keep them walking with Jesus. When we begin to know our purpose, we stop wandering aimlessly in our Christian journey. Uh, This is what it looks like in a church family. Jeff, can you put that target up on the screen? we have to recognize that this is the way God has purposed us to live as a corporate body, and it also works as an individual. If we don't know our purpose, which is the center of the bullseye, then nothing else makes sense. But if you have your purpose established, if you discover it and you know it, when you then have that purpose, the vision makes sense. And God begins to show you what he wants to do based on your purpose. And when you begin to see it, that vision is clearer and clearer. Then as you establish that vision, now you can establish goals. This is what I want to accomplish based on what God has shown me that I see. Because you understand vision is a seeing instrument, right? But then it goes back to my purpose. And then as I develop those goals, I develop from those goals a plan and a strategy to get those goals done, which is based on what I see and what God has called me to do. And then as a church, we develop programs to accomplish those things. So you see how it works in a corporate fashion, right? It also works that way in my individual heart and life. The trouble is, a lot of times, even as churches, we start at the outside and try to work our way in. We develop a program and think that the program is that which is sanctified. Listen, those programs should be the last things that we consider, but it is those things that allow us to get our purpose accomplished. We need programs, but we don't start with a program. We start with our purpose. That makes sense. I hope I didn't go too quick through that, but I I think it just makes sense. Each and every one of us here this morning, there's not one person that I can look at that doesn't have divine purpose. I might not know what it is for you. I know what it is for me. In the last six years, God has been clanking away. (laughs) And sometimes I've gone kicking and screaming, I have to admit. But God has crystallized in my heart and mind what I am called to. My divine purpose is simply stated this way. I believe that God has placed me here to lead a movement of multiplication. 
not addition, multiplication. Part of what you see in the way I've been leading this church is to fulfill the reason for which I believe God placed me here. It's the reason why, even at today's annual meeting, we're going to, and we'd like to consider going to anyways, a two-tiered elder authority here in our church because it allows us to multiply more. It's the reason why we developed our leadership development program so we can multiply individual leaders. It's the reason why we develop training for elders and shepherding elders and deacons and deaconesses, which is right now being honed. There's a reason why we're doing that. There's a reason why I'm, I'm venturing into a, a new scary thing that will just encompass some people here in Huron County. It's scary. But I'm telling you, I'm excited. Because it allows me to fulfill the reason that I believe God placed me here. Now, I don't need to talk about me. There is someone who has also been on this journey recently. And I'm going to just interview him for a few moments. And Brad's going to come. I just got a few questions for Brad because he's just a, an average Joe like me and you, right? Let's be honest, there's nothing average about Brad. <laughs> and that's what Carrie says. Is that up, Brad? That, that would be the on way thing. <clears throat> Is it on? Is it on? All right. Is it on? I can't tell anything. Let me see. Let me make sure. Yeah, it should be. If not, I'll share this one. I'll lean okay. in for you. Okay. <laughs> Just don't kiss me. <laughs> Brad, one thing I think is necessary because I think for, for some of us, um, we think that for someone like me to claim that I have crystallized my purpose, that I must have some kind of special dispensation from God. And because I'm a pastor, I'm kind of special, Right? And it's okay for me to know purpose, so let me ask you, just for these folks, give us a bird's-eye glimpse of your spiritual journey to this point. Okay, so I grew up in this church um, ever since birth, I guess. Um, growing up in this church, um, always, always been here, been a part of everything we've done, been a part of faith, um, church, spiritual things, all of that. Um, and then, I, I don't want to say the, the typical um, experience of just kind of grew up here, and then when I went to college, finally faced for the first time the, the true world and having to make my faith my own. Um, that is what happened. Um, and so I went, went to college um, and kind of was alone for about two and a half years, and then finally my junior year found a really good group of friends um, and started into a Bible study, and then by the end of that year and then the next year um, started leading a couple Bible studies um, and so started then to really grow, uh, really, really understanding what my faith, my faith is, not what faith is, but what my faith is. Um, and then through that, uh, grew through that whole situation, that time frame, um, and then eventually got an opportunity to go to Ashland University and, and run track there. But through that, I, I got to witness what discipleship was, what growing and maturing in faith really look like and what kind of life on life as a Christian really look like. Um, so I started meeting with a, with a guy named Joe Magalette. He's the gentleman that married Carrie and I. Um, but we started discipleship, and I eventually worked into an internship with the Navigators and with Fellowship of Christian Athletes with him. Um, and he taught me how to study the Word. He taught me how to have a quiet time. He taught me um, truly how to have a, re a growing relationship where I'm seeking after Christ. Um, and since then, um, it's just been uh, a, a journey of, of learning and growing. And not only that, but he gave me this idea um, that God gives us about multiplication, about discipleship. It's my faith is not my own to keep. My faith is mine to share um, and, and to give others. Um, and so that's kind of where my walk has okay. has led me to this point. All right, good. I'm going to ask you very specifically then. Uh, it's a two-part question. Okay. How did you discover your divine purpose okay. first? And secondly, can you tell us 
uh, at least as clearly as you can what that purpose is. Um, the process of, of figuring out my purpose, uh, it really, I wanted to say it started just recently, but it didn't. It started a long time ago. Um, God has given me gifts and abilities. He's given, God has given me things that I really enjoy, passions, um, but they were misguided. There's a lot of things that I love doing, a lot of things that I felt God was maybe kind of leading me to, but I was not led by anyone else into those things. So I always wanted to, but I never got there. And I guess the first instance that I got was meeting with Joe Magalette and trying to figure that out. And then the second time, um, Coach Ramsey, the Ash Women's basketball coach, uh, two coaches before my wife, um, she kind of told me about having and setting a transformational purpose statement. And, and that's where it kind of started for me. Um, and I have my first one here. Um, and it said, so my purpose then, and it's kind of transforming, is to lead young men by teaching and demonstrating a life of true masculinity through discipleship. To live a life of purpose on purpose. And in, which is really interesting because this life on, living life on purpose living life of purpose, on purpose, started even before we started um, where it has kind of grown to in our leadership development group. Um, and that's really where it's kind of taken off from there, um, trying, to, trying to set my future and knowing what I'm supposed to do. And I completely forgot what the second question was. Um, I might have answered it already, but what was the second question? Uh, can you tell us exactly what that purpose is now? Yes. So, well, in a way. Uh, my purpose then was very muddy, very not clear, and it's less muddy and unclear. It's still, um, it, it, it's, it's getting there. Um, but through our discipleship um, program or our leadership development group, I know that God has set me on a path um, to, again, to, to work with men, help men grow, but to... Um, give my life and offer my life to others, um, teaching them, demonstrating through discipleship, through close relationship. And um, part of that being, um, hopefully in the next couple of years, getting into the ministry, um, being involved in that and being involved in the sport um, side of things and the, the exercise side of things and the nutrition side of things. Um, my, my purpose is, and it's, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like, um, but going in the direction of serving the kingdom of God um, with my passions, the things that I have um, gained in my life, and, and that's, that's the direction I'm going. Awesome. So you would say it's not specifically crystallized clear, but it's becoming clearer. Absolutely. Okay. And in Absolutely. that process of clarification... The frustrating process of clarification. Yeah. Yes. As we learn. <clears throat> As you are clarifying your purpose, how has that given direction for your life? Um, like I said before, trying to figure out what my purpose was, it was extremely frustrating in that I always knew, as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, that I have, um, I don't know, Ephesians 2, 10. Nine's another one. Um, I would have corrected you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, that we all have good works. And I think everybody asks that question. What, what am I here for? What am I supposed to do? And then everybody asks the same question. What is God's will for my life? Um, so it went from a frustration of not knowing now to a frustration of knowing but figuring out how to do it. Yeah. Um, and so God has been making it very clear. Um, he has been giving me... Uh, an ability to, to narrow my focus, I guess, is, is a good way to, yeah. to say it. Um, if you ask my mom, I am somebody, I, I have problems with attention. If, if I would have ever been tested, I would have had ADD for sure. Um, but my mom always said that I had too many drawers open. If I had too many drawers open, I just, oh, I, it, it was awful. I couldn't do anything. Um, and I had too many drawers open with trying to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life. Um, because I enjoy doing a lot of things. If you ask my wife, it drives her crazy. I like to learn anything and everything I can. Um, my wife is somebody that she's very good at what she's good at, and she likes to do only the things that she's really good at. Um, that's why she's really good at what she does. Um, I, I like to, to get into everything, but what this has allowed me to do is know where I'm going, and everything I do, 
I'm making decisions to get closer to that purpose. Not walking down this rabbit trail and realizing that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. So starting over and then going down this trail and then starting over until I finally find it. I don't think God wants us to take the shotgun effect of let's try 1,500 different things and hopefully one sticks. I don't think he wants that for us at all. Yeah. So as you're clarifying this purpose and becoming funnelized, I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. Yes, it is. Okay. So as you're becoming funnelized... And, and it is clarifying, it's giving direction for your life. So you're saying everything is now finding itself within that funnel. Yeah. What does that do inside you? Well, back, frustrating. It, it frustrates me. Um, but it's, it's good. It's, it has caused me to grow. Um, when, whenever you have time with God... Um, and you come back, and, and, you, and if you've kind of been a, away from him for a little while, and you're, you're not in relationship with him, and you come back, and he just kind of, you just kind of feel it already. It's like, I have not been living according to my purpose. I know that I haven't been doing what you've called me to do. Um, it has given me an ability to, to stay focused, but also have such a joy. Um, figuring awesome. out what I'm supposed to do. And, and one thing that, 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 that it kind of annoys me when people say this, it's just <laughs> like, oh, well, God's going to use that. And God's going to use that situation. Uh, what, whatever you do, God's going to use it. Uh, yes. <laughs> but, I mean, God doesn't want us to sin. Never has he ever said, well, I want this person to sin. Yes, he's going to use that despite our sin, but he never wants to use our sin. If it was up to him, we wouldn't have any. Um, so, so I, I don't like that idea of like, we can just do whatever and then God's going to use it because he's just God and he can do that. Well, yes, he can. He's powerful enough, but why do I want to test it? You know, so, so he's been giving me the, the ability to stay focused, stay on track and be extremely, um, effective and productive for him. Awesome. Awesome. Now a comment and then one last question. Well, let me back up two comments, one for you, one for, uh, I know that there are uh, we are heading into our new semester, new year of leadership development group, and there are 14 people that are right now unaware that in our second semester we kind of hammer things like this, right? Absolutely. So not only to those 14 people, but to everyone here today, <clears throat> what would you say to any of these folks that might not right now understand this is my purpose and I really don't know Uh, what encouragement would you give them what would you say Um, God is God he is sovereign over all things and he's able to accomplish anything despite you Um, God as Doug said before and as scripture tells us he does have an, an intent and a purpose for your life and it is God's intent and purpose for you to know what his intent and purpose is in your life. So if God wants you to know it, if you, do, if you start taking steps to try to figure that out, he's going to be right there ready to give you answers. It's gonna, it may be frustrating. It may take time. For me, um, walking down the, the, those steps of figuring it out, I really got some progress, and then God completely changed my life. <laughs> and I did have to start over, but it's because he had to take me out of some of the things I was already doing um, to send me in a direction of the things he wanted me to do. Um, so the, it is possible, 100%. But not only is it possible, God desires it for you. Because if you are going to affect the kingdom of God the way he wants you to and the way he intends for you to do, you have to know your purpose. And so if God wants you to know it and if you need to know it, God's grace, his power, and his mercy is going to be there to give you everything you need and to be gracious and merciful when you fail and have joy and give you peace when you do find it and back and forth and back and forth and that whole... um, journey it takes to get there. Now, <clears throat> you might not understand, but part of the design in his life matches the design of where we're headed even as a church. It's a challenge for us, and you're going to hear some of that in our annual meeting, the way that God is heading us. Not only do we believe that across the street we need to put up a community center, but we also need someone to lead what we do in that community center. 
And we believe that God has given that to Brad. And so it's been fun for us to see how that has been happening from the ground level up and how God did that as well in Zach's life and how the things that we are progressing forward, we're moving forward in things. And this July, we look forward to adding Zach to our pastoral staff as a youth pastor. It's awesome to see the way God is moving. And we believe that that's another case with Brad's life. Now, if you think that there's nothing but, you know, rainbows and Skittles at the end of this purpose-driven and purpose-found life, uh, that's not reality, right? And I don't think you've heard Brad say that it's all rainbows and Skittles, which, by the way, I'd rather have M&Ms. <laughs> Just say it. But I can also say this, but there is nothing I bet that Brad and, and I would attest to to discover and to be engaged in fulfilling your divine purpose, there's nothing more gratifying. You're still in the process of unfolding that, right? It's becoming Absolutely. clear? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can, I, can I say one more thing? No. No? Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, another thing that, that I hear people say all the time is just like, oh, like when, thing, when things start to come together and God does some things, it's like, man, I, I just look how God works things together. Um, when you're actively engaging and in, in seeking your purpose, you see God moving as he's moving, not later. Mm -hmm. And that's what's awesome. As things were happening in my life, frustrating things, God taking parts of, huge parts of my life and, and forcibly taking them away from me, um, tr trimming those branches, the, mm -hmm. the good, even the good ones. Um, he was taking those things from me. Even as that was happening, I could see that it was God at work um, narrowing down what I'm supposed to be doing. So instead of seeing at the end through all the frustration, it's like, oh, God was in that. God was in that. It all worked out at the end. It, it, you don't have to wait till the end to see God working. Yeah. If you're actively seeking your purpose and, and, and going after it, you're going to see God work at every step and understand he's the one that's narrowing my focus, narrowing my purpose, and bringing me to where I need to be. Awesome. Guys, if you've heard what Brad is sharing it expresses the reason why we exist here at the New London Lions Church. We exist to create environments where people can encounter hope, gain purpose. There are way too many people around us who don't have the privilege of knowing what Brad now knows, what I have discovered, and what God might be leading you in. We have loads and loads of opportunities to help people around us gain purpose, including you. But that's why we're here as a church. Part of the excitement we have as a church is to see that that's happening with a Zach. It's happening with a Brad. It's happening with a, where's Dave? Dave. Right there. It's happening with a Dave, and it's, it's happening with a Derek, and it's happening with a, a wherever Stephanie went. And it, but you get the idea. And with, where's Rachel? Where's, where's Rachel? I just wanted her to raise her hand. I saw her from the beginning. <laughs> because in a few weeks, you're going to hear her share up here of how... God has been leading her to experience transformation. It's an awesome thing. And it's not just for the spiritually elite. It's for all of us. Here's what John 15 has said. I have chosen you. Jesus said this to his disciples. He can extend it out to us. I have chosen you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit remain. Paul said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I have chosen the weak, the base, the things that are not, the despised. And we're all in that. He has chosen us. We have to recognize God has chosen us and has placed in us a divine purpose, and He wants us to fulfill it. 
I don't know what challenge you face. I don't know where you are in the process of discovering the reason for which God has placed you here. Maybe you're on the front side of that. But I hope that hearing Brad, you will be encouraged to know it's a process. And where he is now is not where he was a year ago or two years ago. It's a process. And God begins to unveil it and unfold it. But will you allow God to paint his beautiful plan and purpose for your life? Will you allow him to be the artist that produces a beautiful picture in your life? I trust you will. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I can't pretend to imagine the great things that you have in store for each person here, but I know that that's not beyond the scope of reality for you. You know us each intimately. You hear us each time we cry out to you. You walk with us step by step, moment by moment. Each and every one of us you do that with. You are God. You are sovereign. I want to thank you first for that, and I want to thank you that your plans are just as unique as you have created each and every one of us. I know in Brad's life, The things that we believe you are proportioning for him and the things that we believe you're leading us into as a church. I don't know of any other church in our district or in the alliance that has a position like we're creating for Brad. But we believe that you have called him and we believe that we have a plan and a purpose that through this sports and health and exercise, you will allow us to make disciples for the kingdom of God through that ministry. I can't, I'm not smart enough to birth that. All we did was stay yielded to you. And you're doing great things. We say thank you. God, would you do great things for each man, each woman, boy and girl that's represented here this morning? Would you be just as individual and unique as you have created each one? And then, God, I pray that you would allow each person here to have a heart that seeks after you. A heart that wants to not just know you, but know your plan and purpose for their life. And then, God, would you just give them that spiritual energy that when they discover it and begin to be engaged in fulfilling that purpose, God, that you will allow that light to shine so vibrantly through them that others would see their good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. I make that my prayer for each person here today. I know that there are many who are here and are frustrated, aggravated, because they haven't seen the clear painting And it seems like God is never going to make sense out of what he's doing. Give us patience. Give us trust. And a deep faith that trusts you implicitly. And I will thank you and praise you for the awesome things that you will do in the hearts and lives of each person here. Bless, Lord, now this, your word, these thoughts to the hearts of every person here. Lead them and guide them right where they are to where you want them to be. And then, God, I pray right now for the food that has already been prepared. And as we eat of it, I pray, God, that you would strengthen us by it and allow us to enjoy good fellowship around the table. And then, Lord, I would also pray then as we do that and as we head into our annual meeting that you'll also bless that. Unfold these things before us, even in our annual meeting of the things that you want to do this year. So we give you the thanks. We give you the praise. You are God, and we worship you and love you today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.